and gentlemen, Heart of the Earth is excited to welcome you to the new environmental TV game show, where good stewardship of the whole earth begins in our own community. And now, here's your sustainability host, Angela Hart. Welcome to the Heart of the Earth show. We're talking about sustainability, the environment, and we've got the whole community involved. We want to welcome everybody today, but first I have some thanks that are due, and I don't want to forget to do it, so we'll do it first. Uh, the Green Side Up Garden Center donated some trinkets and some souvenirs related to the environment to the students to take home and the green partners and the speakers, which was very nice of them. Staples donated some prizes. Anyone here win the prize before? We had some prizes given out they gave us. Uh, pie Pizza, Goodfellas Pizza, Stop and Shop, and ShopRite all donated some um, food goodies for everybody today. And I wish to thank Staten Island Tech for letting us film here. It's been such a pleasure. The crew is so professional. Uh, Frank Mazza, thank you for giving us this opportunity, for believing in it. We really appreciate that you let let's us do have this. Fun. Let's so play let's have game. fun. Let's play and this time we're starting on this side again. And but first, well, I want to introduce <coughs> to you our speaker, Michael Shanley. Tell us where you're from and what you like doing. My name is Mike Shanley. I am a fifth and sixth grade science and math teacher at Staten Island Academy. I'm also the president of Friends of Blue Heron Park, one of the oldest uh, organizations on Staten Island uh, that concerns themselves with land preservation and conservation issues. Beautiful. And now what I'm going to do is introduce the students and then come back and speak to Great. you. So let's start on this side. Tell the camera your name and what school you're from and what you enjoy doing. Hi, I'm Shannon Henry. I'm from Curtis High School and um, I'm captain of the boys and girls wrestling team at my school. And yeah, You're captain of the boys wrestling team? Yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> want to wrestle with you. You must be strong. How'd you get involved with that? Um, I wanted to do football and my dad told me no, so I did boys wrestling instead. And I love it, and it's awesome. A little safer, maybe, too. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's a lot funner. So. A lot funner. Okay, great. Yeah. How about you? Where? What's your name? And tell the audience where you're from. Um, my name is Salali Camacho. I am also a Curtis Warrior, and yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm interested in medicine, but I love writing and dancing. You're interested in medicine, and you like writing and dancing. Yeah. What a well-rounded lady. <laughs> and you, you, ma'am. I'm Stacy Shapiro. I'm from the Middle High School, and I want to major in medicine, and I like playing piano. Two medicine majors. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Hear that, Doc? Yeah. Hi. My name is Monica Rogowski. I'm the president of Newark High School and also the captain of the handball team. You're the captain. You're the president of the school. Whoa. Good going. Yeah. Congratulations. What do you want to do? I want to be a pharmacist. Beautiful. That's a wonderful career. <laughs> and you, sir, can you introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Chris Williams. I'm the owner of Williams Adworks, and I'm the Boy Scout Council president, and I'm the the non-expert advisor to this, this winning team. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of experience with these things, but he's also not only the president of the Boy Scout Council, but he's also involved with the Rotarians, and he's very active in the community, and we're very honored to have you on the oh, game. My uh, we thank you for being here. It's good support. We appreciate oh, it. Thank you. And um, let's go with this young man here. Um, my name is Bernard Veneziano. I go to Portland High School. I'm a senior. Um, I'm an athlete. I like to play golf, and I also play football. How long have you been playing golf? Um, about five years. Five. Are you good? I, I try. <laughs> great, great. How about you, Mr. Mirage? Yeah, I'm a junior at Port Richmond High School. I like to play guitar and I run track as well. And what subjects do you like? I like history. I can tell because you were really listening well in one of the other games we had and you, you guessed, you had all the answers. You seem to have a lot of knowledge base there. Good for you. And your name? Norman. Uh, my name is Norman Clark and I go to Susan E. Wagner and I run track and I also play the piano. Wow, terrific. What songs do you like to play? I play classical piano. Really? And, yes. and who inspires you the most? My dad, because he played guitar, so. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Which uh, famous musicians inspire you? Mm, I like Beethoven a lot. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Maybe someday we'll have you come on and play on the show. Okay. Terrific. We'd love that. Don't let me forget that, okay? So email me on my web or my blog or my Facebook and, and say, remember me? You said you want to have me on the show and we'll have you play a concert, okay? We'd love that. How about you? Hi, my name is Tamar. I'm from Susan Wagner High School. I like to write and uh, play the guitar. Welcome. What kind of writing do you like to do? Just to get my mind on paper. Isn't that great? It's yeah. so nice. Yeah. Hey, what do you really do? Hi, my name is Dr. Mark Salemi. I own uh, North Alabama Hospital in Staten Island here in Port Richmond. Um, I'm very active in the veterinary community and I love working with kids and, and things like this and uh, supporting them as much as I can. And he's also got a Boy Scout dad? 
Uh, yes, we have a Cub Scout Den. Cub Scout Den in where? In, in, in New Jersey, in Willem Park, New Jersey. That's terrific. So we have another community member who's very involved and helps kids and helps the community and everyone here cares about the environment. So let's get ready to play the game. And this nice speaker that came on the show is going to share a little bit. First, I'd like to know, how did you become involved with Heron Park? Um, at an early age, I, I got involved with Clay Walney, who some of you may know from the Advance S. Clay. Um, we were involved with cleanups in, in Long Pond Park, various other parks, taking garbage and other refuse out of the parks. So that really sparked my interest in the outdoors. Uh, I'm now an avid bird watcher and have recently developed a love for moths. Moths? <laughs> Tell me about the moths. Um, well, it's, they're fascinating, and we have thousands of species of them in New York, and uh, you can attract them using various lighting rigs, and we have an event every year at the Greenbelt, uh, National Moth Week holds it, where we attract moths and learn all about them. It's fantastic. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. And how did you then become president of the organization? Uh, I got involved with Blue Heron Park about 10 years ago as a weekend naturalist. I used to drive two and a half hours from college in Albany down to the park on every weekend uh, to, to just guide people and visitors throughout the park. Uh, I developed a real love for it and um, now I'm president. It's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. I'm so honored to have you Thank here. You for Thank you. Me. Thank you. Do you happen to know how they got the name? Uh, Blue Heron Park? Yeah. Um, well, there, there's a pond there no, called Blue Heron Pond and uh, for many years in the 60s and 70s it was a real magnet for wading birds such as herons and egrets and so um, over time it just became known as the place to go see blue herons and so uh, it's still there today and there are still blue herons at the park and I encourage all of you to come visit us in Annadale and Point on Avenue and, and come see them for yourself. Do you give tours? I do. There are, there are naturalists there every weekend uh, from 12 to 3 that offer free guided tours of the park. Free? Free guided tours. And all of our park. programs are free as well. They're all free. See, mm -hmm. that's what I like to hear, all about free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so tell me, does a blue heron look like a blue bird or a blue jay? Or, uh, a or blue heron is, is quite a large wading bird. Uh, it eats fish, frogs, and things like that. You see them in Clove Lakes, Silver Lake, a lot of the, you know, the more um, common parks that people visit. Uh, and they're here, blue herons are here throughout the year. They're even here right now during the winter, uh, although they're less common. Um, and um, they're, they're very large birds. What does a wading bird mean? A wading bird is a, is a large um, bird. People mis commonly mistake them for cranes, um, oh, that's but great. herons, egrets, and, and another family called bitterns, which are marsh, more marsh wading birds. They, they wade in the water. They have very oh, long legs, wading. they mm -hmm. have very long necks, and they're, they're, I've evolved to adapt to those kinds of environments. Has anyone here seen a heron out here, blue heron? Yes, you have. I saw a peacock at Staten Island Hospital. Was that escaped from a, the zoo or something? Uh, yes, peacocks are not native to New York. Uh, however, there, as many of you know, there are wild turkeys down there as well. Yes, yeah. no, this was a beautiful peacock. Yes, and yes. Um, I was hoping, but it seemed that the people there that had seen it before, so it wasn't anything unusual, and they weren't getting all up in arms. Yeah, there, there's a various escaped uh, birds, domesticated birds that do escape, and, and you can find them uh, throughout the island. Beautiful. Well, thanks for telling us about this. Would you like to teach us a little bit about frogs? My least I favorite subject, I didn't tell you. Do you know I hate frogs? No, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I hate frogs. <laughs> well, I'm you sounded so enthusiastic when we talked on the phone, so I thought it was a great topic. I know. I had to laugh. God has a sense of humor. I said to my husband, he's going to cure me of this phobia of frogs because I'm having someone come up to speak about frogs. I actually rather be in a room with some snakes than frogs. <laughs> so I really mean it. I want to get over this phobia of frogs, and learning from you will help me do that. That's I hope why so. I said no. Don't bring any live frogs. No, no. Did you see that? Yes, I did. Three times. Bring pictures, not no. live ones. No, frogs are totally harmless animals. I know. And, and I know. So you have nothing to worry about. Okay, so let's hear about them. Please. Okay, well, as uh, many of you know, Staten Island is a real um, oasis for wildlife. Um, we are the borough of parks. Uh, we have thousands of acres of green space and parkland. Um, for example, the former Staten Island landfill, uh, the New York City Department of uh, Parks and Recreation have transformed this former dump into a beautiful oasis for wildlife and, um, and plants as well. Um, for example, uh, recently species such as the fox, uh, coyotes, bald eagles have all been found on Staten Island and this is really a testament to um, that transformation. Um, Frogs and amphibians uh, are also um, common on Staten Island and some of, the, of, of our woodlands. Some of the more common species that you may encounter are uh, green frogs. They're the most common. Fowler's toads are toads. They're, they're, they're frogs that kind of live on land, um, and they're also amphibians, and they, they can also be found in various places. What's an amphibian? Uh, an amphibian, uh, it's a water 
lives in the water uh, for most of its life. So um, frogs and salamanders would also be considered amphibians. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a number of species of those on Staten Island. Thank you. Did you know that? Oh, because you're going into medicine, so you know about biology. Did you know that? You did. Okay. So I'm the only. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so reptiles and amphibians have a very low tolerance to pollution and to habitat fragmentation. So they are great environmental indicators. Um, we at one time, Staten Island historically had many species of frog that are no longer found here. Uh, examples are the cricket frog. Um, that was a species at one time that you could find on Staten Island. Unfortunately, due to overdevelopment, many of these species have been lost. Mm -hmm. Recently, scientists discovered a new species of frog right here on Staten Island, in our very own marshes, in our own backyards. Uh, this is huge news. Um, a new species of amphibian has not been discovered in New York or New England since 1882. Any new species discovered in a huge metropolis like New York is big news. This finding confirms uh, research done by Carl Caulfield in the late 1930s. He was a former director of the Staten Island Zoo and had written extensively on the reptiles and amphibians found in our region. Um, at the time, his uh, hypothesis of this new species living here on Staten Island was dismissed due to lack of evidence. However, recently, uh, scientists from Rutgers University, using genetic testing and acoustic testing, te basically um, listening to their calls and then comparing them to other species of similar frog, they were able to determine that this was, in fact, a new species of frog. I read in your notes that they have a name called? Correct. This, is, this new species of frog is called the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. There are two other species of frog which are similar that are also found in our region, the northern and southern leopard frog. And this species of leopard frog has a very distinct call. And as a young naturalist out in the field, um, we, would, we would occasionally go down to the marshlands near the Gotham's Bridge and we would hear this frog calling, and we would always say to ourselves, wow, it, it doesn't quite sound like the southern leopard frog, and it certainly doesn't sound like a northern leopard frog. And at the time, we weren't really aware of this paper that Caulfield had written in the 30s, so we were kind of um, perplexed by this. Uh, and, but sure enough, it turns out this was indeed this new species of frog, the Atlantic Coast leopard frog. And yes, they do have different mating calls than, than these other common species. That's fascinating. I hope you're a little less scared of them yet. Yes, uh, that okay. is fascinating. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. You can hear these different sounds. Again. Yes, absolutely. And, and through really sampling and, and recording their voice and then, and then testing it acoustically, um, I guess using a spectrograph, they're able to determine that the coal is very different and distinct from the other similar species. This, is, this was some of the evidence they used to determine this was actually a new species of frog. And this was determined how recently? Um, the paper was just published, actually. Mm -hmm. So the species of, is officially, I, I guess, in the process of being described taxonomically. And so um, I would expect to, to hear more about this uh, in the news. Okay, well, this team has a vet on it, uh, Dr. Salemi. So I hope you are listening, Dr. Salemi. Listening. There's a lot of pressure on you. I'm listening. Okay. The frog is closely related to the southern leopard frog, which is a very similar species. However, this is a distinct species from it. So now we're going to start from the game. And just to refresh your memory, uh, these questions, the speaker's questions, are worth one point. If you get three correct in a row, we then allow you to answer a purple question worth ten points. If you get any of the questions wrong, we spin the wheel for the other team to see what happens to them before they start answering questions. Um, let's start on this side with this nice young lady. With her team, I should say. <laughs> What is the four-word name of this new species of frog? Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. Yes! <laughs> one point! Okay, first point scored for the ladies' team and the gentlemen's team, and two green partners with them, we'll call this. Because we have, this is an all-school game, and we're really excited. We have Curtis and a new dork, and here we have Wagner and Oh, wonderful. This is terrific. <laughs> okay, one score for this team. I read about one point. What about you? What's the next question, sir? About how many years ago did Carl Caulfield perform this research about this new frog species? They have to get it over here. Oh. Until they get it wrong, then we'll... 84. What? Remember, you want to speak out so the viewers can hear you. They want to hear your reasoning skills at home. In the 1930s, so... 70 plus 14 is 84. Very good. Yes! <laughs> Another point scored for the team on the right. 
And the next one, if you get this right, you're going to go to score, uh, to get a chance at 10 point question. Why are reptiles and amphibians great environmental indicators? Because they are sensitive mm -hmm. to um, the, um, the, yeah. the surroundings, their environment, the environmental the changes. There's pollution or habitat okay. changes. They're very um, sensitive to environmental changes and pollution. Right? Yes, okay, another point. All right, you're all scored up with three points. Now comes the 10 point. Did you meet Jeremiah? He's a man. You will. He's a man whose voice was uh, on the announcement before. He's a very talented musician, and he's put together over 50 CDs. Very, very good. So, okay. So, what percent of our planet's fresh water originates in mountains? Is it 24, 68, or 80 percent? Okay. <laughs> is this true or false? Mountains exist on only half of all the continents. False. Uh, false. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Another 10 points. <laughs> I'm surprised you know that answer. <laughs> okay, true or false? The highest 14 mountains in the world are all found in the Himalayas. True. 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 Another 10 points. <laughs> <laughs> Brains, my goodness. <laughs> Oh, here's a good one. True or false? Mountains occur more often in oceans than on land. True. 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 You know what? <laughs> Another 10 points. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, something more challenging here. <laughs> okay. True or false? You can find different ecosystems as you climb up from the base to the peak of a big mountain. True. 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 It's true. true. <laughs> okay. 10 points, and now we come on to the side. <laughs> Are you with us or not? Yes, I'm with you. Where are you going? I'm Look like you. you're falling right asleep. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're going to spin the wheel to find what happens to Bernard's team. Bernard. Yellow. Back to you. That means it's back to them again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next question. True or false? Because of peak load plants. Along a mountain slope, every ecosystem can change quickly from one area to the next. Is this false. true or false? false? You're right, it's false. It's because of a rapid change in al altitude and temperature. Very good. How many points was that? That's another 10 points. <laughs> 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 um, okay, now I have a question for you, Bernard. Yes, okay. Let's see how your memory is. Uh, we'll have to take, what did you say, chamomile? What was the herb she said was good for memory? Do we remember that? I don't. She said memory? Yeah, there's a certain herb that's good to help your memory. But I don't know if we learned it today. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. 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 Yeah, well, let's see. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Some mountain areas, in some mountains, the rivers are permanently frozen. These frozen rivers are called what? Glaciers. All right, 10 points. Here's another one. Hawaii is at the top of a volcanic mountain in the Pacific Ocean. What percentage of the mountain is below seawater? Is it 20, 30, or 50? 50. 50. 50. That's 50. the answer? 50. 50. Correct. In fact, it's more than half, but that's yeah, the correct that's answer. You got yeah. 10 points on that. Okay. Mountains occur in what percentage of the world's countries? Is it 15%, 45%, or 75%? Mountains occur in what percentage of the world's countries? 15, 45, or 75? 75? 75! Another 10 points! Yay! How about 75? <laughs> Okay, good job. Okay. Next question. Mountain ranges are long chains or groups of usually ranges are usually how long in miles? Two hundred, five hundred, or a thousand? A thousand? A thousand! <laughs> Say, you got a good green partner! That's another 
10 points. How are we doing? What, how many points do you have, sir? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 63. And how about you, sir? We have 40. Okay, so another question for this side of the team. True or false? Generally, mountains are higher than 600 meters. Is that true or false? True. true. You sure? Final answer? True. true. Yes. yes. Okay, another 10 points. Okay, this is a serious one. True or false? Mountains are anthropogenic. Is there another pronunciation? Don't say it. My pronunciation is correctly. Anthropogenic. 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 Can you repeat the question? The mountains are anthropogenic. True or false? Anthropogenic. You got a 50-50 shot. Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. Oh. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. True. 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 Anthropogenic sorry, means made or generated by human activity. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so what do we do now? We spin the wheel for this side of the uh, board. Let's see what happens now. Oh, it's going back. Ten. Ten oh, points. It's still going. It's still going. Okay. I lost my temper. Okay, so uh, one point. Green partner there. This is going to count as one point. True or false? What is an ozone level? Is it an extra layer of clothing, a layer underneath the earth, or a layer of methane protecting us? A layer of methane protecting us. Yes. That's one point. Yes. Okay. What is composting? Do you know that answer? Yes. Yeah. Tell us. Like it's kind of when you use um, for instance, rotting, rotting fruits and vegetables and like old newspapers and put them together to um, create richer soil and you use um, worms usually for that. Worms! worms. That's worse than frogs! <laughs> <laughs> uh, banana peels? Banana peels? Apple cores? Eggshells. Eggshells? Yeah. 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 So do you have like a little box at home? I mean, how do you do that? You usually put it like, if you have like a, like I have a garage, so we put it in my garage and, like, you can put it in your front yard, or like you can have it next to your garbage in the back. Do you think this would attract frogs? Uh, no, but if you're composting the right way, you aren't going to get a lot of odor from it. No odor. Can you tell us a little bit about composting? Well, composting is the breaking down of organic material down into basically soil that's nutrient rich, and it can be used, uh, like they said, to help in the aid of growing plants. Um, but if it's done correctly, uh, you will not get much of an odor from it, although you will get quite a bit of heat from the chemical processes that are going on inside the compost bin. So is your garage warm? <laughs> well, it's warm either way, so... It's warm anyway. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's interesting. Have you done any composting on this side? Do it on your wall side? Yeah, well, At home, just, just do it now. We, we make piles of leaves, and, you put it, sure. and instead, of get, instead of bagging them, you can put them in your corner of your property, and you get them breaking down, and you can use that for um, fertilizer next year. So instead of taking the leaves away, what okay. Dr. Salemi does is keep them all in a pile. And do you have to cover them with anything special? You don't have to. You don't have to, no. So you just leave yours open like that? You leave it open and it'll compost down, and you can use that. It takes, it takes a good year if you have a big pile. It takes a good year for it to break down. And it breaks down into very good soil that's good it for planting to, plants and dirt. vegetables. It breaks down to dirt, yeah. Yeah, it never made sense to me to take leaves away from the ground where they fell naturally and then we move them somewhere. It just something about that doesn't make sense, so I think it makes sense to keep it for yeah. composting. Grass cuttings, leaves, anything, mm -hmm. anything you peel off at home. So do you grow any tomatoes? All the time. I'm, I'm going to hit you up for tomatoes. I'm coming to your office and say, I want to be a homegrown yes. tomatoes you talked about on TV. Everybody, yes. Dr. Sulemi, is going to give everybody some garden tomatoes when they go into his practice next yes. week. Okay, why is recycling clothes so important? Three questions here, three choices. Whose side are we on this time? It's your turn again. It limits oxygen in the atmosphere. It makes renewable energy, and, or it saves landfill space and helps others. Three! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Landful space and helps others. Um, what do we know about recycling clothing these days? Who's doing it? See, this is a problem. Does your school recycle? Mm, I, I, I recycle. Sure you recycle clothes? clothes? Drive yeah. and a they food, have like they have a clothes drive and a food drive. Like you bring in like you, like old coats and stuff and they donate them to like the Salvation Army. and. Mm -hmm. That's very important like that. because people can use them. But a lot of us will take an old ripped shirt and think, well, nobody wants this, and they just throw it in the garbage. But you know how long it takes? I think they said 10 to 15 years to disintegrate into the landfill. So we're putting our clothes are not garbage, and they don't belong in the landfills. So keep in mind, even if you have a ripped item or a stained item, 
put it in the clothing recycle bins and the recyclers will come and take it and either process it down to something else um, or dispose of it in another matter that's eco-friendly or give it to people. Well, yeah, what if it has stains or something? And, and no, no, no. I'm talking about the things that you think that nobody wants. Okay. It's good to recycle them. Um, okay, you guys are doing great. I'll take care of that question. This has been a fun experience because you're all so smart. Why is it important to reuse old material to make new material? A, to preserve natural resources and reduce our carbon footprint. B, America doesn't have enough money to produce new material. <laughs> C, <laughs> it's easier to reuse old materials. Or none of the above. It's obviously B, guys. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what did you well, say? But the viewers can't hear you. I said it's obviously B. But <laughs> no, 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 no